Welcome to Hockey Nights in Vegas, episode 81. I guess we'll just call this one the eulogy. My name is Eddie Rivkin. I'm joined, as always, by Chris Chapman of Fox Sports Las Vegas and the pride of Las Vegas, Lindsey Brown, ladies and gentlemen. This episode, like all others, is brought to you by the Las Vegas Advisor at www.lasvegasadvisor.com. Your home for everything Las Vegas. Restaurant tips, food trips, tips, strip club tips, entertainment tips. Just don't get your hockey prediction tips from us because... What? Okay, I'm kidding. We had some good ones, but we're not going to get into that. Uh, Today is day one A.D., that being after the death of the Golden Knights Stanley Cup defense. May 6th. (sighs) I don't think, honestly, any of us, if you really got down to the deep, nitty-gritty truth, expected them to repeat and expected them maybe even to get to the Western Conference Final. We've spent the whole year discussing the turmoil, the ups and downs, the injuries, Apparently, nine players had surgery during the regular season, according to uh, Bruce Cassidy. The Golden Knights lost 2-1 in a hard-fought, tight Game 7 yesterday in Dallas. But if we put our We Are Vegas Golden Knights fans hat aside, can we say that the better team won, Lindsay? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I think it, it for for all the reasons that you've laid out that we've talked about uh, at nauseum throughout the season, it just felt like Dallas could flip it when they needed to, when they needed to make an adjustment like they did after game two where they stopped hitting as hard. And then in game seven, they brought it all back. They actually out hit the Golden Knights last night whether that's getting scoring from uh, from their secondary options. Joe Pavelski was extremely quiet this series, which was pretty wild. So was Rupe Hints, but they had their young guys step up. And there just seemed to be an uneven distribution of production, of performance across the board for the Golden Knights. Last night, when you have a, a couple of looks wide open on the back door for both Jack Eichel and Jonathan Marshall, so neither of them go, like, that's hockey karma that you can't really deny. And so even though they kept that score low, which I think was imperative to give themselves a shot, it just felt like that game was closer to what we saw in game five than game six. And they nearly played it perfectly in game six. And I just think they ran out of gas. Yeah. Well, I think for me, the, the, the aspect that I will look at is that the Dallas stars punished the golden Knights for every single mistake that they made. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, Bruce touched on it. Marsha. So hits a post. I mean, it should have, he, he absolutely should have put it in, uh, 10 seconds later, Dallas comes down and scores. But what Bruce didn't tell you is that Dallas goal was the direct result of a Shea Theodore turnover where he got lazy and tried to backhand pass it through the neutral zone. And it was intercepted and there really was no chance Aiden Hill had on that goal. As you, as as he mentioned, Jack Eichel, he puts it into the side net when he's got an open net to make it two to one at the end of the second period, very first shift of the game or of the third period, Dallas comes out, they score the eventual winning goal. But again, what he didn't tell you was that goal was the result of the golden Knights not being able to clear the puck out of the zone. It looked like maybe a miscommunication between Alec Martinez and I think it was Keegan Colasar. Uh, neither guy got the puck. Dallas grabs it. Radic Foxa with a really nasty backhand shot. It takes a deflection in. It hits someone. But that's puck luck. You create your own puck luck. I'm a big believer in that. And, you know, sure, we could we could look at the empty net misses. But at, like Lindsay said, when Dallas needed to be better, they were better. And... The frustrating aspect to me is this series should not have gone this way. Like you come home up two to nothing and let's be realistic. We can be realistic here. You play a very lazy 30 minutes of hockey at home. You somehow get game three to overtime only to lose where one of your better defensemen is beaten on a play that he shouldn't be beaten on. Dallas wins that game, and I think you kind of had to feel that 
once they won that game, they were going to find a way to push it at least to six. I didn't expect them to win three straight, but it's it's a series of what ifs for the Golden Knights. You know, what if you you play the first 30 minutes of game three like you played the last 30 minutes of game three? It's probably a completely different series. In fact, you might be playing the Colorado Avalanche. You might be in Denver right now. But it doesn't matter what if. What matters is that the Stars were the better team throughout the course of seven games. And Vegas really never really, they, they didn't have an answer for Jake Ottinger. And the shitty thing is, Logan Thompson and Aiden Hill both played tremendous series. I mean, you went seven games, and between the two of them, they gave up 16 goals, which is, you know, pretty incredible when you think about it. Over the course of seven games, we're talking about less, what, 2.1 goal a game, something like that. The problem was Jake Ottinger matched them every step of the way and I think was probably better than the two combined. You know, last night was it was a prime example. You have the empty net misses by both Eichel and Marcia, so who were two guys, I think, if you wanted to have the puck on their stick in that situation, were the guys that we would want with the puck on their stick in that situation. But other than that, and the gorgeous goal by Brett Howden, where Alex Petrangelo made his one and only play of the series, recognizing what was going on at the other end of the ice, Vegas generated nothing offensively and every little bit they did create create Jake Ottinger was there he closed the door so kudos to the stars they were the better team over the course of seven games and I think I think the better team advanced and you know Vegas could could hang their hats and and look down and say what if what if what if but what if it doesn't matter I could sit here all day and what if what matters is Dallas is moving on and Vegas is going home. I, I want to, I'm going to push back on a couple of things that you said. <clears throat> you said this, you said the series shouldn't have gone that far after the result of the first two games. I would say that they won the first two games, but they weren't necessarily the better team in either one. They were only the better team in game six mm-hmm. of the, of, of the seven games. You can delve into the why, and we we probably should, and I will a little bit. And as far as Jake Ottinger versus Aiden Hill and Logan Thompson, to me it was a push. The reason that, that Ottinger gave up 16 goals in seven games isn't that much about him. He didn't have a Logan Thompson game three performance in that series. Not, not even close. He didn't have to. And that's my point. The Golden Knights created no high danger chances. They, all the things they talked about all year long, getting to the blue paint, the hard ice, and everything else like that, they were ineffective doing that. So yes, he gave up 16 goals in seven games. He has a stellar save percentage. But the amount of shots that the Golden Knights landed, the amount of high danger shots that the Golden Knights landed, made it a pretty easy ride for him yes he made the big saves when he had to and aside from logan thompson's difficulties in game three both him and aiden hill made tons of bigger saves because the dallas stars outnumbered the golden knights in high danger chances at least two to one if if not higher than that this series was always going to be about could Vegas finally find its game after 82 games of various injuries, oddities, different lineups, new additions at the trade deadline, you know, all of those intangibles. And the answer is a resounding no. They never, they found their game. They had the pride of a champion in game six. They won that game. But aside from that, they never really found a true home for Tomas Hurdle. Noah Hannafin was a standout. Besides the two game-winning goals, he was a standout player. Anthony Mantha is on a milk carton somewhere and will never wear a Golden Knights jersey again. Easiest prediction ever. But they lost this series because of a culmination of things that happened in the regular season. A, 
they just gave away too many points. Captain Mark Stone said, hey, we probably should have done better in the regular season to improve our position in the playoffs. Yes. But they so they gave away a ton of points to bad teams, to Anaheim, to Arizona, right? To teams that they had no business losing. They just showed I don't arrogance walking into the rink thinking that they were going to win. They gave away at least 10 or 15 points that way. I can't, I mean, we could go back game to game, but we don't have that kind of time to do it. Yeah, I mean, you got swept by the Buffalo Sabres. Yeah, I mean, the they they got what was coming to him. I applaud Kelly McCrimmon for realizing that he had a flawed model. He knew they were in trouble, right? Yes, he's Trader Kelly, and he does everything at the trade deadline. But I believe, and if I, if I ever got a chance to ask him, and I would even ask him off the record just to see what he would see what he would say, he knew that the team was in trouble and had never gelled, and he pulled out every magic trick in the GM playbook to try to load them up with stars to get them over to the hump to the point that they may have found their game. A valiant effort, but it didn't work. Um, and the Golden Knights are, in my opinion, justify justifiably out. What do you have to add, Lindsay? Yeah, I, I don't know if it's about arrogance as much as there's like an assumed automatic. Like it was it was assumed that they would figure it out even though they were dropping games to teams that they weren't supposed to. It was assumed that the talent that they acquired, which is high level of talent as you could ask for, was going to gel right away. There's an assumption that Mark Stone was going to be the same incarnation he was last year when he returned from injury. I am ready to like Mark Stone had a pretty awful series by my cap, by my watch. And, and I think he's one of the best players in the league. I, I think he's going to come back strong, but the amount of turnovers, the amount of times he got knocked off of pucks in areas that he normally wouldn't. And the thing is about Mark Stone and other players on this roster is that they have a ticket to be special because what they do things that other people can't like Noah Hannafin does uh, backwards behind the back drop passes. I know it sounds redundant, but it, because he has the vision and he has the ability to get those passes down. Most people get that beaten out of them at some point on the way up. Jack Eichel could go coast to coast if he wanted to. Most people would say, don't do that. Let's get the team involved. But when you had players that were getting pushed off of spots that they were supposed to be good at, when you had the defense playing as shitty as they were, like this team is built from the defense out. And there is an assumption that things would be able to be switched on. And we could talk about this all offseason because now we have plenty of time to do it of just why this team, when things start to go poorly, they start going into these habits, like the amount of time that they spent centralizing their play in the top of the offensive zone is one of the direct reasons why this series went so upside down, whether that was on zone entries, which I talked about the last episode or last night where you had just pucks on the sticks of the defense. We're trying to get them through. We're trying to get them through. That's not what this team is built to do. They have to get that puck down lower. They have to get the low to high, or at least from the flank in. And you're so right about the high danger chances, but at the same time, like in tight is where Jake Ottinger is the absolute best. Like he's a battle bot goalie. He's great at cutting down angles. He's great through his center, but in terms of having those mid range looks, and I'm not saying clean looks, it's more about, say the puck gets blocked down and it goes to your shot. They weren't in position to, to make up for broken plays. They were relegated to the outside. I'm looking at this, you know, high or high quality edge NHL.com stats, which has a lot of room for improvement, just like this gold Knights team. And they are, they were in the 90 over the 96th percentile, I think in terms of skating distance, 93rd percentile skating distance. And they only had an eight and a half shooting percentage. Now those don't directly correlate, but we saw how relegated to the outside this team was and how much busy work they were doing. And that was a, a tenant the entire season, but it's just, it's fascinating to me how even with the amount of talent that they were able to acquire, that they went back on habits that I think were worked through last season. Now, every season's different. You got to learn the lessons over and over again, but 
they just weren't thinking right. They weren't playing smart hockey at all. And they weren't willing to play the hard way the whole time. And that's how you earn the ice and earn the des designation to get those pucks, to get the looks that you've earned. And Dallas was willing to do that. And they weren't. That was a lot. Go ahead, you, know, you said you said a lot about not being able to find their game. Lindsay kind of brought it up a bit too. And I think realistically, we could look at it from they started out 11 0 and 1 on the regular season. And even during that stretch, Bruce Cassidy made comments about them not playing at their best. The puck luck was on their side that night, or something along those lines. I think we could make the case that from Game 13 on, they were an average at best team. They did nothing special the rest of the season. There were gl gl glimpses into the future, right? Or, or there were there were moments where you're like, all right, they found their game. Like the night that they beat Edmonton, who was riding that 16 game win streak coming the four, into the, the four game road, the four game roadie through the yeah, central. He, yeah, there there were <clears throat> moments, you know, the trip to New York where yeah, they lost the Devils, but then they they blew out the Rangers at Madison Square Garden. You know, I think to me that's the most frustrating thing, and I don't know why and maybe it's as simple as chemistry as to why they weren't able to find it the final 70 games of the regular season and for large pockets of their brief postseason experience. But I think you kind of touched on it where Kelly McCrimmon maybe realized that whatever was there was not going to be enough. But I also think that Kelly McCrimmon has the wherewithal to not look at the short picture. I think maybe he he was willing to take the L this season to reload and make a run at it next season mm -hmm. because of the move for Hannafin, who there was even talk that he was going to sign the extension the day he was traded, and it took a little bit longer, but he got it done. Getting the San Jose Sharks to, to retain 17% of Tomas Hurdle's salary and he's locked up for the next couple of years. So a couple, it's couple. least there till twenty thirty. Yeah, he's, so he, in the he's 30s. gonna be there for a while, six years. I'm gonna be forty years old by the time that contract's on. Don't check my math though. You know what's kind of crazy though, Hurdle. You look at it and you're like, he kind of got old quick, and I don't mean like his play, but the last time we saw him in the playoffs was five years ago. And then all of a sudden, here he is popping up with the Golden Knights in the playoffs. So, like, there, there, there was a stretch where we all remember how good of a player he was, but we didn't get to see it because the Sharks were so bad. But I think it leads to a really interesting offseason. Um, well, before we, before we get to the offseason, um, and that's where we're going next, you know, I think that – I think you're exactly right. I think Kelly said Noah Hannafin is the future on D. Petrangelo's got, I think, three years left. Yeah. You know, Martinez is 37 or 38. He's in the last year of his deal. And he's he, probably done. He, yeah. I mean, the way he skated around the ice last night and was looking up into the crowd, it was his goodbye. That, 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 yeah. That's it. Yeah. I mean, I think that, I mean, listen. And we're not going to make excuses. The fan base is going to make excuses. And they're more than entitled to. They're fans. Fan is short for fanatic. They can say anything they want. And there's all kinds of reactions. But in real world hockey, the Golden Knights played seven preseason games, 82 regular season games, 22 Stanley Cup playoff games, had obviously the shortest summer break, Last year, they didn't have any injuries. Yep. What happened the year before? Didn't make the playoffs, had a long summer, right? Long playoff or short, no playoffs, Stanley Cup. Next season, tons of injuries because potentially of a short summer, not a lot of time to rest. 
right? Come back, seven exhibition games, 82 regular season games, a fuck ton of, of man games lost, over 500. Early exit from the playoffs leads to long summer, plenty of healing, lots of new faces. The Keep hunger going. factor, the hunger, hunger, you sit there with your failure. Right. So <laughs> I, I, fe- I, I feel it. like while this hurts now, it was exactly the appropriate um, result. And I, I disagree with you a little bit, chap, to say that they were an average team. They had 98 points, 99 points. They underperformed from their potential. Well, I said from 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 game 13 on. Right. You know, but so game 13, they had they had 25 points after 13 games out of 26, something like that, right? 11 had, one. Well, I, I right. What is that? Third 20, 23 right. points. So, so they had they had seventy six points through the the last seventy some games, something like that. Th- they weren't an average team. They just weren't anywhere near what the ether of the Stanley Cup probably made us over expect a, a, a little bit. Um, let's let's briefly, and we're not going to do a report up card episode because those things get really long and people seem to not really like them as that much overall give the season for the golden knights a grade from a to f not a lot of explanation just take in everything that we've been through all the games that we watched all the things that we've talked about over the course of the last 30 episodes or whatever it was this season Lindsay, what was if you were going to be a teacher and grade the golden knights 2023 24 season what's the grade C minus and please see teacher for tutoring because like you said, it's like, it's a success compared to the other half of the league that didn't make the playoffs. It's a success that they were able to uh, maintain some momentum from their last season. But as I've talked about all the tenants that made this team great, I think they struggled with all year. I think it was a pleasant surprise that the goaltending played as well as they did in the playoff, but otherwise that was it was an adventure on a night by night basis. So I'm I'm C minus, but mostly because I'm I'm watching Toronto and Boston's replay, and I just saw Toronto get scored upon. I'm getting just the feelings. Chat. Yeah, I'm I'm in that same rage. I'm going to go with the C. I think the expectations were obviously quite a bit higher. Sure. We're losing in the first round of the playoffs. I think you know this team holds itself to a much higher standard than a lot of teams around the league, and I think there's a lot of accountability within the locker room. And they never really peaked outside of those first 12 games. Um, frustration, disappointment. You made the playoffs, and, and obviously that's always a, a positive because you have to be in the show in order to win the show. And I just think once they got there, they, they kind of missed some opportunities. So overall, I'm going to go with the C. This square in the middle, it's an average for me. Like, there was some good. There was some really bad. At the end of the day, it should have been better. I agree. I think I think, it's, I think C, is right, C is right on. They didn't meet the expectations. The expectations might have been a little bit high. But they could have done much better for themselves, and they didn't. And that's, you know, that to me, that, that to me is the Achilles heel. They owed it to themselves to not be swept by Buffalo, to not lose three and four against uh, Anaheim and Arizona, whatever those games were. I mean, if you rate it on the the the, the bell curve, it's a huge disappointment. But if you take a, take all of that stuff out of it, all the noise and everything like, and you just look at the <coughs> eighty two regular season games and seven um, playoff games. The, for other teams, that would be a B plus, A minus season. <clears throat> but for the expectations of this team and the talent on this team, I think C is. I think C is exactly spot on. Now we move on to the mathematics portion of episode eighty one. Oh dear! God. And this should be a fun because some of the people on the panel 
professed not to be very good at math. <clears throat> Lindsey Brown. Well, I have four so, concussions and too many pucks to the head, so I have an excuse. Okay. So we're going to we're going to do this in round numbers to make things just sort of easy. Do I need a calculator? No, I'm I'm I think I can get this I I can get us to where what I want to talk about fairly easy. Okay. As of this morning, the Golden Knights are about $14.5 million over the salary cap for next season. Now, listen. Does that, so, does that include Robin Leonard? It does not include Robin Leonard's LTIR, as we okay. assume that's for, uh, for sure. Fans, don't send in the comments it was $14,295,000. Asshole faces, we're keeping this in round numbers so we can all do the math. Okay. <laughs> That's the disclaimer. Um, escrow, escrow. So, Jonathan Marcheseau, unrestricted free agent. Alec Martinez, unrestricted free agent. Chandler Stevenson, unrestricted free agent. William Carrier, unrestricted free agent. Michael Lamadio, I think also unrestricted free agent. And then they have Dorfeyev and... Um, I think big he's the only he's big 46. tall blonde kid. Wrong beer. Yeah, oh, that's that it. guy. Big tall blonde kid, 46. That's him. So they got a couple RFAs. They have some huge decisions to make. Yep. And like we said at the top of this episode, this team is going to look sig- they're they're in the worst cap situation that they've been in in the seven years, which is okay. It's sort of the price you pay for going to the dance and for that really shiny ring we picked up last year. But let's talk about how they're going to get under the cap, away from the cap, and how do we, I mean, everyone in the everyone in the fan base is we have to keep Jonathan March or so. I've said on a number of occasions, I don't see it happening. I did some very rough cap numbers, and... If they, well, not release, if Martinez doesn't come back, Mantha doesn't come back, Stevenson doesn't come back, there is a way that they could potentially have six or seven million dollars of extra cap space. But Jonathan Marshall is not signing for six or seven million dollars. He's just not. And I don't know that there's a way, even if you take out Carrier's 1.4 and Amadio's 1.025 or, or whatever it is, this team's going to have to make some tough decisions. They have zero fucks given for making the hard decisions. Mark andre Fleury, Riley Smith for a bag of tape, and on and on and on and on and on. So let's just go, and, and we all have that, extra chip in our 27 chip in our pocket. So we'll talk about that last. Easy. Yes or no. Jonathan marches. a golden night last year or did episode 81 have that ominous spooky coincidence that our last episode of the season is his last game as a golden night. Lindsey Brown, where is Jonathan marches next year? That's such a tough question because like, I feel like somebody's going to offer him big money and, and just out of respect, like to the longer term thinking for him, it's hard for me to expect him to turn down like big money. And I know we'll say like, well, Montreal is going to do it. Montreal. We don't know that for sure, but I know, but we know that outside of the goal production that he brings other elements to that locker room, right. To a locker room that maybe hasn't found its way yet. I think he would be a great pickup if, if Toronto wasn't so cap strapped with four players that are making above $10 million, but they've already tried to, to, to make that move too. And so, and I think the big thing for him will be term. I think we've talked about that too, Eddie, where it'll be maybe the Golden Knights are say two years. I I don't think his agent would be doing his job, his or her job by saying two years sounds good to us. Unless Marshy is dead set on finishing his career here. Um, I don't think you can um, depreciate yourself after the year that he's had. I think he goes somewhere else. Chat. Yeah. Well, I've come around on the idea that he will not be back. 
Um, I know I was pretty adamant early on in the season that he would be back. But I think the 42 goals actually made it less likely that he would be back mm -hmm. than him coming back. Like if he scores 30 goals, you're like, okay, that's about what he does. We can figure out a way to make him under fit under the cap. The problem is he's 33 years old. He's going to be 34 two days after Christmas. So fairly early in next regular season, about a third of the way through, he'll turn 34. I don't think you're getting another 42 goals out of him. But he should be paid like a guy who scored 40 goals in, in the NHL. He should be paid like a guy who's won a con Smythe. So somebody will give him a nice big payday. I just don't think it's here. I think you want to get younger because this team, one of the things that they've done in acquiring Tomas Hurdle, acquiring Noah Hannafin, acquiring Jack Eichel, acquiring Mark Stone, they've traded away a lot of prospects. So there's not a lot down on the farm as they say, in baseball. They've got some good, talented young defensemen in Caden Korzak and Lucas Cormier. But outside of Brendan Brisson, they don't really have a forward who you look at and say, well, this guy can come in and play next year. So by virtue of getting better, they've also gotten older. And I think you need to get younger if you are the Golden Knights. So having a 34-year-old Jonathan so at $7.5 million for the next three years, that may help you next year. But that may not help you two years from now. You think that he's going to get seven and a half? Well, I I'm just throwing it not out. Here. Uh, not I'm, here. Well, but yeah. Hurdle makes six, seven, five. <laughs> I'm like, seven and a half is no, crazy. Hurdle. Hurdle makes eight something. Yeah, because San Jose is retaining nearly 20%. Oh, true that. Good call. But right. I think the the thing with Marcia so is he picked the best time of his life to have a career have year. A career year. And the, the team couldn't is, maximize it. I don't think Vegas is going to be able to find a way to pay him based on and, and listen, like I mentioned about 20 minutes ago, this is a team. Kelly McCrimmon doesn't just think about next year. He's thinking about 25, 26, 26, 27. How do we get better? And I think, unfortunately, Jonathan Marsh so just becomes a casualty of this team being constantly up against the cap and not having any prospects down on the farm to come in and be able to produce at the level that they need them to. Jonathan Marchessault needs to get his flowers. This is his last contract. He has like 16 kids, maybe 17, something like that. He's, got a, whole, one, he's got a whole fucking line. I, right. I mean, he's got a line 2D, a goalie, and some some reserves. Yeah. So he he needs to go get some money. The thing that I, that doesn't really concern me because I, I agree with you. There, there's just not a way to find find enough money for him. The thing that concerns me about him is if he's going to get his flowers, his hockey gods payback for getting his flowers is he's not going to a contender. True. So he's a Con Smythe winner. He is a 40 plus goal scorer significantly later in his career. But if we looked at the teams who have the cap space, it's the Ottawa's, it's the Buffalo's, it's the Columbus. I'm looking at Columbus, Columbus right now. Right. It, it's the it's the Coyotes will have it. Right. The Yeti. Right. So I mean, it would be it would be lovely to go up to see Jonathan in Salt Lake as long as it's not in the middle of the winter. Um, <laughs> but. He's going the sacrifice that he's going to have to make to get his flowers is he's not going to contend for the cup anymore. 
because no contenders got that kind of cap room laying around. No, that's just that's basic hockey economics. So three votes for thanks, Jonathan. Uh, we'll have a really cool video for you when you come back. Right. Yes? And, ju- and, and just for like context too, for teams that are trying to me- be contenders, like if you just look at the signings that Dallas has, where you have Joel Pavelski who makes three, five, and I don't know what his past contracts have been, but it's been around that. And then when they went out and got Matt Duchesne, now Matt Duchesne is certainly not anything close to what, what Jonathan Marsh is. is. I will not make that comparison, but he signed for one year at three mil. He's getting a raise, and he's and he's thirty, th- and 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 uh, Duchesne's thirty three. But he might not be getting a raise in Dallas. No, Correct. well that's it. You see, here here's here's the issue that I I foresee. I don't think that there is a hometown discount big enough that Jonathan Marshall so could take. You're exactly right. That, that, Correct. You're exactly right, and and, and nor should he take it. No, nor I, I he is never... he's earned. Every yeah. single thing that he has coming. He I'm, should I'm player, not take it. I'm always player first. No offense, Mr. Foley, but I'm not on your side. Great. I'm always having Mr. Foley game. as a guest. Chapman just buried the boss. Way to go. We <laughs> Way had to go, chance. pal. Well, Thanks, well, pal. Listen, I, here, here's the thing. I don't necessarily <laughs> know if Mr. Foley is on the owner's side either. Like, Foley spends money. There's other owners who, who don't spend money. Yeah. They just have a team that's under the cap every year don't compete but i will never begrudge a player for taking more money no. which is why we'll we'll get to a guy i'm sure and and that will be my absolute stance on him too okay we, we've exhausted the marches of thing the rest of these should be fairly easy no way martinez comes back i think he retires you got to get some of these young defensemen up here. You're you're too deep at that position to commit to him. He's in and out of the lineup. He's played valiantly. He's one of the best shot blockers to ever play the game. One of the best leaders. Uh, you you got to get Caden Korzak in here. You got to do it. Okay, that one was easy. Uh, Chandler Stevenson, two point seven five million dollars. Didn't have a fantastic UFA season. He was here on an absolute hometown discount steal of a contract. Was fairly invisible in the playoffs, but somebody's going to offer him four million, right? Four and a half, something like that. For three go get years. it, Chandler. Go get it. Yeah, right? here's here's the issue that Chandler Stevenson. He had sixty four points in twenty one twenty two. He had sixty five points in twenty two twenty three. He only had 51 points this year. So he hurt himself, I think, with his production this year. The one thing with Chandler is he's reliable. He's in the lineup pretty much every night. Yep. So I think you don't have to worry too much about that. 75 games played this year, 81 last year, 79 the year before that. So I don't think you need to worry too much about, about him durability-wise. He's also but a different player when Mark Stone's not in the lineup. I think, I think yes. he is a guy who... And that's a little. And this is who I was talking about. This is the last big contract Chandler Stevenson's going to sign. He's got two young children. He's from, obviously, from Canada. Go get a big contract somewhere. Be close to your family. And, you know, I don't know if his wife is Canadian or if you met her when she lived, when he lived in D.C., but go get your money. You've been a, a, a valiant player for this team. But you have earned a raise. And again, I don't think that this team can find a way to fit him under contract with what they're going to need to do in the offseason. And uh, he's to, he, to me, he's four by four all day and all night. Yeah. Yep. Right. Four by four, four by 4.2. Only so, 30 and can skate well in this league. That's yeah. going to pay well. Right. I mean, mm-hmm. uh, again. In, in the in the great annals of the Golden Knights, he might be the best pickup ever for a fifth. True. Right? Great beat trade. Him, beat him beat him for the cup when he was in Washington. Traded for literally a bag of pucks. Yeah. Fifth. Right? He was on the shit pile in Washington. He couldn't crack the lineup. Couldn't crack. The, he was a healthy scratch a whole bunch of times. He comes here. The, he the had steal eight, of the franchise so far. 18 points the year that the Capitals won the Stanley Cup. Yeah. I mean... 
again, I, I'm with you 100. percent I would like to. I would like to see him stay, but the economic reality of it is somebody's going to give him four by four, four by four and a half, something like that, and he's going to go. Yeah. Yep. Lindsay. Yep. Yep. Anthony Manta wasn't who, even who here. I think, I think salary wise, could find himself on a team that contends. Yeah, he's in that mid. He he's he's in that L.A. Kings might be able to afford him something something like <laughs> that. What? <laughs> Just kidding. I'm Can't making jokes. It. It's I hard for joke. me to tell. I joke. He could Winnipeg, replace Mitch. a team like that. Winnipeg or Winnipeg could, might be a good one. He could replace yeah. Mitch Marner in Toronto. Yeah, I was gonna say he could. Toronto would be a good, for like seven million less. Maybe Carolina. Like yeah, who's a I mean, team that needs speed. There's a lot. There's a lot of homes lot. for a, a 30 year old skate like the wind, 50 yeah. points a season, centerman. Yep. Chandler, thank you again. We'll have a very nice video for you. <laughs> um, thank you for your service. Um, Anthony Mantha wasn't even here, right? You you were just advocating before we started the show that you wanted a seven year deal at six he mil. Eat my ass. I don't know why you're you're Eat switching for the ass. for the audience, Eddie. No, be yeah, your authentic gone. self. I don't even think we need to go into it. He's gone. Right. <laughs> thanks. Thanks for stopping by. Uh give I hope you had a nice steak at uh I, I hope you enjoyed Bones. your time in the nice weather here. Yeah. Somebody else will never wear 39. I don't know why you're like this, a... Eddie. It's such a shocking to me. He's only oh, yeah. 29. Yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> yeah. Okay. He doesn't fit. No, he doesn't. Um, Will Carrier. You got to re-sign him. I, I don't think so. What? Are you serious? I think I think they let him oh. walk. You think he gets the Belmar and out he goes? Yeah. I, oh. I, my, my problem. Because they is, don't want to pay him or because he wants too much money? I think it's a combination of both. What is he um, going to ask for? I think well. I think the problem is two, two million. Here, here's here's the he's problem. Making, what's he making now? Who's got cap friendly up? He's 1. got. 4? I do. He, he's making one four. I I just I just think you need more games out of him. 52, 63, 56, 39 games this year. He can't stay healthy, and I think that's a problem. I I think listen. I think you crazy. let him walk, and I think you slot Paul Cotter into his role. Paul Cotter cannot do what he does. Oh, I I'm disagree not. with that. I think Paul Cotter absolutely. I think Paul can Paul Cotter can be every bit as phys physical and and is a has a better scoring touch. I, and that's the thing. I think he gives you a little bit more scoring. He doesn't change the tone of the water when he gets out there, though. Yeah, but how how much and maybe he could be? grow into that role if but he hasn't been asked to change. He hasn't been asked to change. I know, maybe that, yet. but that's where Cotter's yeah. in at set Cotter's in at two more years at 775. That's the play. <coughs> We've already let like four guys walk. What if we're yeah, to let all those guys thing. walk? Like, why here, do we have to let Kyrie walk? You have a combination of Paul Cotter and Jonas Rombeard. And while they're both not William Carrier. They both can play that fourth line left wing. I think you need to save money where you can. And Rombierg and, and Cotter can help you fill that role. Whether it's a combination, whether one guy beats the other out in camp, I think that's the play. I think one of those two guys is your fourth line wing next year. If they Alone. either of them had any time in the playoffs of two years, I might have I might no, be no, one to play ball, but there's a reason why they're not out there, even when they were trying to, to switch up the lineup. Get, you have to cut salary in certain places. I know. Especially, I would, especially if they, they do the opposite of what we think and they do sign Jonathan Marsh or so. You're gonna have to make up that money somewhere. I would like to I, I would like to see them re-sign Will Carrier. I love the guy. You go two Will, years at two and a half with him, and you say no to that. I just I just well don't think hold that two at two and a half because I'm going to tell you that William Carrier will be a member of the Dallas Stars next year. Well, now um, two two years two and a half. Let's talk about Michael Amadio. Resign his ass. I if think you've got a, if you've got a two so if you have to give either of them if you can't give both of them. 
Carrier and Amadio, two and two and a half. Which of those two do you give the two and a half, Lindsay? Don't ask me that shit. Oh, you, know, oh, you, know, you know how big of a fan I am of Michael Amadio. And there, there's no better person besides Ben Hutton. And Ben Hutton doesn't have the scoring touch that he does. That, so, that comes in and out of the lineup like Michael Amadio. But that's the thing is like, He's a great infusion player, but then he'll disappear for a while. Like, there's a reason play- why Bruce brings him in and out at times, well, right? Play- Sometimes you're the plays- odd guy out. He plays himself into the press box awful lot. Correct. And so that's where And then plays out of it. You're right. There's consistency questions on both sides. You have carry yes. with the consistency with injury, and you have gameplay consistency with Amadio. But if if there's a person that I send out, be like, Go four check them to hell. I pick fucking Will Carrier every day of the week and twice on Sundays. But Amadio might be willing to take uh, another another short deal or another cheap deal just to stay here because this is a guy they picked up off of waivers in Toronto, right? But um, I I just I don't maybe it's just my brand. Like I don't see why you can't do both if you're already cutting salary like we've gone through already. And then you know my move that I've been advocating for for we're the get, past. We're getting season. to that. I know. I know. Okay, chap, two and a half million, two years. You have to give it to Carrier or Amadio. Well, the good news is I don't think Amadio gets two and a half a year. I think less? he gets I think he gets less. I think right now he's the believe it or not, he is the lowest paid guy on the roster. Mm-hmm. He makes less than Jonas Rombier. Not by much, by about four thousand dollars a year. He can't but Cotter makes the league minimum, seven seventy five. According to the cap friendly, Amadio's salary is seven six two. Yep. So I, I don't. I don't the point, that can't the be point right. I'm making is you could give Michael Amadio a million over two years, and he's happy. He's 27 years old. I don't think anyone else is going to offer him much more, if at all. And the other thing is the no state tax for a guy who's making somewhere at the minimum of what the league salary is that no state tax is huge it puts a lot more money in his pocket so i think amadio is a guy you keep you know what you're getting from michael amadio you know he could gel alongside william carlson you know he could play with brett howden if you need to move him up for a game you know you can move him up to the second line if you absolutely need to and i think he i think he's improved i think he improves every year so He's a cheap role player who has the propensity to go out and score a big goal every once in a while. I'm keeping Michael Amadio. I don't even think I don't even think there should be a debate. They're gonna need to have some bottom six people. And Amadio seems like, you know, especially if they can get him at a million or a million two or something like, you know, a Ben Hut even a Ben Huttony kind of deal. Yeah. You know, you know, that sort of thing. Cause like you said, Lindsay, you, I sort of equate those two together with their ability to be out of the lineup for a, a fairly decent stretch and not show any any symptoms of not playing when they jump right back into the lineup. So, you know, I, I would like to see them keep both of them, but the money's awfully, awfully tight. And I feel like unless Will Carrier eases off the throttle of what he thinks he's worth, He's going to probably be gone, and I think Amadio is going to stay. I just hate that. I hate this as much as Chaps take the other day where he wanted to sit Brett Howden. I hate. I. I just. I think you have to. I think you. There's room for both. Who are the? Who's the RFA? Ronberg? No. No. Doro. Dorofeyev is is mm-hmm. the RFA. D- Dorofeyev's going to have to take a, a nine hundred thousand by two. Well, he's twenty three, so. You gotta know, stay you, young, chap. You gotta be young. You're not gonna lose him. So I think I think he's he gotta get a, a bridge deal. Two years, nine hundred thousand. You know, I think he gets a bump, but I don't think he gets you know anything that's gonna break your bank. And you, you play know. him with William Carlson consistently next year, and see what happens. And then, well, in in summation, we'll do this. We'll do the summation, and then we'll get to the. By the way, there's some weird. Uh, Yuri Patera is also an unrestricted free agent, the third string goalie. 
He's a UFA, but I don't know what it means when it says he did not accrue the required games by the age of 25. So I don't know if that makes him a restricted free agent or it, it might it might have something to do with waiver rights. Yeah. The ability so, to waive them or something like that. But I think he'll be back. I think he'll be in Henderson again next year. So March is so gone. Martinez gone. Stevenson gone. Mantha gone. Carrier, we would like Carrier and Amadio, we would like to stay. Right? Yeah. Dorofeyev gets a little raise. And then we all have this chip in our pocket. We have a $5.2 million chip on it. And that chip is number 27. Shea Theodore. When they signed Noah Hannafin, I think that they allowed for the very real possibility that they move on from Shea Theodore. And I think that it won't be as controversial as losing Jonathan Marcheseau because Shea Theodore, uh, his defensive woes are well-documented and discussed just over and over and over again. But Shea Theodore has the ability to garner draft capital. He, his version of a two-way trade is salary cap plus draft capital plus. I don't th- unless they can get a take back, you know, of, of a middle six guy that they can get for little money, you know, two million. If they could get a Duchesne for three million, if they could get that some of that kind of deal with with Shea Theodore money, uh, they would do it. We floated. I can't, uh, Lindsay. I don't think you. I think it was just me and Chap that were talking about it. How do you like Shea Theodore? For Allmark, one for one. Ooh, does that get a little? T- does that get you a little? That, that certainly opens up the imagination. Um, because they have because, Aiden Hill for Aiden Hill for one more year at four point nine. Correct. And Boston is a motivated seller. They were they were looking to move on from him during the deadline. You have to look at how Jeremy Swayman is playing. They have a ton of. Uh, I mean, for for Boston. Um, moving on, and even last year when uh, they won the President's Trophy, I think they're they're on the hottest streak right now in terms of a shoe. If you're playing blackjack, where you were down to like a ten dollar chip and you got hot and somehow, but it's not sustainable. They're gonna have to make some big time decisions. And so Allmark makes five is five million next year, and so it'd be a it'd be a, basically one year for one year. Right. I don't hate it. I don't hate it. Um. And it would give them some some different stability at the goaltending position, but if you make that move, that almost signals to me that they're going to move Logan Thompson because I don't know you don't push him back down to Henderson, right? No. This is yeah, like this is where and you know what that's a discussion they can have as well. Um, Are you okay man, if they move Lo- Logan Thompson? I am, but then we're having the conversation of you're having, you know, two $5 million goaltenders, which just this for, team just for, just for one year. I know. I know. Um, I, I want to chew on that a little bit, but I, I, I okay. like the way that's going. I like the creativity with it. I think it would help fortify. And this would be a guy that is well used to playing, uh, uh, a tandem style, right? And, and big so, boy hockey and in yep. a tough market. Correct. And I, right? I th- yep. And, and young. Would, yep. And young ish, young ish. Yep. He's 30. And so, and, but you don't have the same added miles on like old goaltenders did where if they were playing in their mid twenties, they were playing 60 games. And so I like, I like where that's going. I do, but that, um, yeah, I'm not, yeah, I, I have to think more about, do I, do I think the Golden Knights should run back the goaltending tandem that they do have? And I, I'd probably look to improve that. And Aiden Hill isn't going anywhere. So like you have to move Logan Thompson. And so, well then who could you, how you, this is, this is what we talk about like two weeks from now after I have time to chew on it, like how, who you could dance with, with the Logan Thompson trade as well. Cause I think he could be a, a guy that could garner you some picks as well. Cal Gary. Cal right, Gary. Oh, right God. back home. Yeah. Yep. 
because Markstrom's not going to be there. No, no, they tried to move his ass as well. You're you're very correct, man. That would be an adventure for Calgary, but they're they're going to be flirting with the basement for a while. Okay, so yeah, the question the question is, has Shea Theodore disappointed you enough that you're open to moving him just for draft picks and salary cap relief? Ooh, nobody wants to jump well, in well, on that I, one. Here, here's, here's the thing. Oh. Yes. There, there's the there's the other there's the other little carrot to this that I will point out. Shea Theodore is entering a contract year. The likelihood of you being able to re-sign Shea Theodore at the end of next summer or at the end of next season is probably small because I think he's going to want a significant raise. Whether or not he's earned that is not up for me to decide. I mean, I don't think I would pay him more than what he's making, but there probably is a team that will pay him more than what he's making. So I think when you traded for Hannafin and you re-signed Hannafin for that nice long eight-year deal, I think the writing was on the wall that you're going to get younger at that position and you're going to make room for Lucas Cormier, for Caden Corzak, potentially Leighton Ahab down the road. You are going to open up spots on the blue line. I think we might see a completely different blue line next season because I wouldn't be surprised if they made some other moves. They kind of need it. But it was supposed to be a position of strength for this team, right? That's all we talked about. They have the best blue line in the NHL, this and that. They're eight deep, they're nine deep, whatever. At the end of the day, the blue line let them down. And I think they're going to make changes on that blue line. So I think if you did move Shea Theodore, look, you have a first round pick this year in Vegas. The draft is in Vegas. And I don't think that's why Kelly would make a move, but you don't pick again till the sixth round. So I don't think you're going to get a first for Shea, but you could oh, get Oh, I do. I, I, Oh, it, oh! I think no. I, I easily, easily a first. They don't have a first next year, so potentially could they get a second this year and a first next year? That Maybe. might be that. That might that that might be a lot. A could third they get a, and a, fir- a third year. and a first? A third and a first. But you also free up five million dollars in salary cap space. Exactly, which is, which is important for a team because- that is constantly up against the cap. And if you figure in, they pick up five point two million in salary, and the cap goes up another four, four and a half million, like it's forecast to go up for the next three or four years. So all of a sudden, you you have a little, you know, a little bit more wiggle. Well, for, all of a sudden, for Kelly and George, go sign a guy like Jake Gensel. You guys are just big fish shopping. All right, this shopping. I, I, it. to me, I let him go. I got, I, I, he, he hasn't impressed me enough. I, and, and I, like Chap said, I don't want to lose him for nothing. And so yeah. there, there's oh. gonna be somebody that wants, and he skates well, yeah. but uh, it's not the most hygienic of skating, but he's still skilled enough to make up for it. So it, I, I think it, you go out fishing with him. Like the, the, the thing is, I think after seeing Noah Hannafin for 25, almost 30 games, he's I it. think Noah. Noah Hannafin is everything we thought Shea Theodore was. Yeah, his replacement. Well, no, but, but, but like of what I his think, potential should have, like yeah, what no, his no. realization yeah. of his potential there was, there was of what we want. Maybe Shea could be could win a win a Norris Trophy. I don't think he's top ten. Nor Noah, Noah Hannafin. Noah, Noah Hannafin Absolutely. is what the Golden Knights wanted Shea Theodore to be. Right, and that's, that's why it. I think he becomes expendable. So thank you. Let's let's wrap it up. I'm, okay. I'm tired. Of, I'm tired of this. Thanks, Jonathan Marches. So episode 81 was indeed the coincidence. It's the last uh, episode of the season. I want to thank the Las Vegas advisor, www.lasvegasadvisor.com. My good friend, Dr. John Pierce at agelessforever.net concierge medicine uh, at its very best. Uh, thanks to all of you. 
Uh, we upped our subscriber numbers. We appreciate the loyalty and all the comments and everything that you do for us. Um, I guess we'll probably be back after a good enough bit of news uh, appears. And it looks like this offseason is going to be full of very interesting uh, news. Uh, thanks, Lindsay and Chris. I appreciate it. It was uh, a difficult decision to keep going with the podcast after Joe passed away. But I'm uh, I'm honored that the two of you decided to, to join me and to stick it out. And uh, we'll end with just like on the uh, NBA when the team's gone fishing. Uh, I'm not a fisherman, but it's uh, golf season, as evidenced by my tailor-made chuck e cheese cool. mafia chuck yeah it's it, it's golf season the golden knights uh are done they lost game seven two to one to dallas the uh, cup is cup defense is officially over when you see us again next time we will have a brand new opening because they aren't going to be the stanley cup champions anymore smash that subscribe button send us comments tell us something that you liked about it or hated about it or don't swear as much you know whatever but it most seriously, thank you all for the loyalty and for all your time watching the podcast. On behalf of Chris, on behalf of Lindsay, uh, the 2023 season is a wrap. Uh, going golfing. We're out of here.